and welcome back. I thought I'd bust some myths that I've seen hanging around my Facebook group and my YouTube channel and on Instagram as well and also just answer some questions because a lot of people get really confused about skincare and they say things like should I use retinol with vitamin C? Should I use niacinamide with vitamin C? Help, I'm not double cleansing. Will my skin break out? Whoa, should I use oil? Shouldn't I use oil? There's so many questions. You must always use hyaluronic acid on damp skin. Let's bust some myths. Nothing is ever black and white in skincare and often the more research you do, the more confused you can become, but don't be confused. Let's just get back to some basics and bust some myths. Let's start with the first one. How do you layer actives? Should you use vitamin C with retinol? Trust me, there's no problem using vitamin C with retinol. Um, and there are products, for example, Kate Somerville does a product that combines vitamin C with retinol. However, if you are one of those people that is buying your actives at a really high percentage and you're already getting slightly reactive skin, so if you're using vitamin C at 10, 20, even 30% at night, and you're also using a retinol at 1%, you're gonna be open to inflammation and irritation. That's a lot of actives going on with your skin. It's why I say, with all of my vitamin C videos, you can use a low percentage during the day preventatively and a higher percentage at night. However, use it on the nights you don't use retinol. If you've got skin that's as tough as ever and you've never had a tingle at a high percent percentage vitamin C or ever had any sensitivity to a 1% retinol, go for it. What I do say is if you're using TRET, i.e. prescription strength retinoic acid, try to avoid all other actives. Again, if you've tried it and you've layered it with vitamin C, go for it. Absolutely not a problem at all. I'm just saying that those two actives have the highest level of reaction in the skin, tingling, sensitivity, redness, maybe slight sort of um, post-use inflammation. Don't layer them up. Use them on alternative nights. Don't think that the more you use, the better your results, because the worst thing you can do is inflame your skin and impair its barrier function. I know, I learned this. I went on a press trip once when I was still at Hello Magazine with Katie Piper, who I've since come to know and adore. And she was interviewing me and looking strangely at my forehead. And what I was doing was in the winter, I was using retinoic acid. I was using a prescription strength Retin-A and I used an acid overnight because I wanted to be glowy in the morning to meet loads of famous influencers at the time. And basically what happened was I burnt my skin and then the next day it came off in sort of a huge sheet. Not good for my skin in any way, shape or form. And I would say on a scale of one to 10, where skin is the toughest and one is the probably the most sensitized, my skin sitting at a seven or an eight. So it can take quite a lot. There are people out there that will be going, ah, I use Tret and vitamin C, I use retinol and vitamin C, I never have a reaction, good for you. But as a general rule, I say don't mix high percentage of actives if they have a tendency to sensitize your skin. And you'll know, because you'll feel the redness, you'll feel the tingle, you'll know if your skin starts to peel. The, the problem is that if they are impairing your barrier function, if they're beginning to make you peel, and sometimes that is a side effect, and it's a welcome side effect with some products, then if you put an active on afterwards, your skin will be so much more sensitive. Slow and steady wins the race. Let's talk about the myth about hyaluronic acid. Last night, I was at a supper with Eucerin and they've just launched a new hyaluronic acid, which is fab. And I realized that while I know quite a lot about hyaluronic acid, I, I don't know enough and I'm determined to do a hyaluronic acid video, but I'm gonna ask them all the technical questions first because I was learning about Kilodalton's nice last night, which is the size of the molecule of the hyaluronic acid used and the optimum hyaluronic acid for healthy skin and for skin finish and so it doesn't feel dry and tight. Anyway, and we got in that whole myth about hyaluronic acid and one of the journalists said, is it true that hyaluronic acid can dehydrate the skin in the long term because it draws water from the skin and uh, should you always apply it on wet skin? And the facialist that was there sort of was like, I had never heard of that. Well, uh, that's all you guys ever talk about on my feed when I mention hyaluronic acid. And here's the thing, that myth that hyaluronic acid has to be used on damp skin belongs to a generation of hyaluronic acid products when they were first launched five, six, seven years ago, and they were a single molecule, fairly small hyaluronic acid. And if they are a fairly short chain hyaluronic acid sitting at around 50 to 150 uh, kilodaltons, I mean, 
not that you need to know that, but if it says it's a short chain, fairly small hyaluronic acid, it does go into the skin where it locks in water. However, it works best on damp skin. And the reason is as it dries and it goes into the stratum corneum, it tends to tighten the skin on the skin and it's not a pleasant feeling. Very handy if, for example, you want to tighten this area of your face or you can dab them on around the eyes and you feel them tighten as they dry because what they do is they go into the stratum corneum, the very surface layer of the skin, and then they start attracting moisture into the skin. However, most modern formulations are what are known as multimolecular, so they have more than one size molecular weight of hyaluronic acid. And what they tend to do is have a short and a medium chain or a short and a longer chain. And the short chain goes in and the longer or medium chain sits on the surface. And that means that you get more of a slip, more of a pleasant hydrating feel because the one that goes into the top layer of the skin attracts moisture and then the one on the surface attracts moisture from the outside. Those old criticisms were leveled at single molecular hyaluronic acid serums launched probably around 10 years ago, and they're not really applicable if you've got a multi-molecular hyaluronic acid. However, I do like to top mine always with a glycerin water-based serum. And that means that the hyaluronic acid, if it can't get enough water within your skin, can trap it out of the skincare that you put on top. It does not really need to go on damp skin unless you've got really dehydrated skin. So no, hyaluronic acid does not dehydrate your skin. It's found naturally in your skin. And the other thing I found out the other day is your skin loses a third of its hyaluronic acid every single day. And then basically it just metabolizes it. Cause you know, it's in every joint, it's in your eyeballs, it's, it's in so many connective tissues your body, and your body reproduces it every single day. That's so clever. Our bodies are so clever, obviously. That process slows as we get older. Anyway, uh, hyaluronic acid does not dehydrate the skin. It's found naturally in your skin. It's good for your skin. It's just a question of layering something that hydrates on top. Myth number two, silicon is bad for your skin. Silicon is not bad for your skin. It doesn't occlude your pores. More often than not, it actually sits on the surface of your skin. It's quite a large molecule. And in fact, it's used in pore blurrers like um, Trini's uh, Miracle Blur uh, and Professional by um, Benefit. And it's a large molecule. It sits on the surface of the skin and it's so large, it actually sits over the surface of the pore and therefore it can be used to blur the effect of pores. If it's combined with light reflective particles as well, it sits on the surface, it can bounce light back and it can give you that instant soft focus finish. If you ever feel skincare that feels velvety to the touch, so not oily, not watery, but velvety and you find makeup that feels like that, the chances are it's got the silicon in and the active ingredient won't be called silicon, it'll be called dimethicone, trimethicone. It'll be the methicone bit that is the silicon. It's not bad for your skin. It does not in any way harm your skin. However, it is not also inactive on the skin. And I say that because it's recommended by a lot of dermatologists to hydrate and heal old wounds. So for example, when I uh, first came out of hospital, I was using uh, silicon strips on my wound and it's taken all the redness out. The simple reason is uh, the silicon sits on the surface. It's a really large molecule. Often it's in a gel format when you use it for wound healing and scar healing. It sits on the surface of the skin. And then what happens is all transepidermal water loss virtually stops. So the skin becomes super hydrated. And as a result, the wound healing processes can speed up. It takes the redness out of scars. It helps scars heal better. Everybody who's ever had an operation should be offered some sort of silicon healing wound healing. I personally prefer the tapes. I'm going to do something about wound healing. Uh, I've got a little dent in the shoulder now. There's nothing I can do about that. It needed to be stitched slightly more tightly. However, there is literally no hyperpigmentation or redness in that scar and it was only three months ago. Uh, that's all to do with silicon. Silicon is not inactive on the skin. Silicon is a really, has a really important role to play in beauty products. Uh, how far does skincare travel? <laughs> That's another thing I was asking an expert the other day. Let's remind ourselves of the layers of skin. The very top surface is called the stratum corneum, which is where the dead and dying skin cells all sort of layer together. Think of it like the tiles on a roof. And then underneath that is the um, epidermis, and the epidermis is the very surface layer of the skin. Uh, now we know that skincare actives get into the epidermis, but actually skincare companies can't really claim that that it happens. But we do know that they do and they've actually put trackers and markers on skincare active ingredients to see how far down they can go. Underneath the epidermis is something called the epidermal dermal 
junction. So the dermal epidermal junction sits and it's the sort of wavy one. Skincare cannot technically go below that level because beneath there is the blood supply in the dermis. And the dermis is essentially is where your skin is made. So that is why skincare is essentially topical and it's not actually medical because once it breaches the dermal epidermal junction, it becomes medical. And once it becomes medical, it should only be available on prescription, hence things like tretinoin. Even though tret is no, not absorbed right the way down, it has a biological effect on that layer, that dermal layer where collagen is produced, where pigmentation is produced. All those things that are produced are in that dermal layer. Underneath the dermis is the fat, underneath the fat lies the muscle, underneath the muscle lies the bone. Fillers, by the way, can go in each of those layers. I don't know if you knew that, uh, injectable fillers. Um, so technically, skincare can only be claimed to go into the stratum corneum. And if you hear a beauty therapist or you hear a skincare salesperson tell you that their active ingredients are going down into the dermis, you go, really? Where's the doctor to give me a prescription then? Call people out on their beauty bullshit. However, I think we know that skincare does go down into the epidermis. We're talking layers that are literally this thin. Your stratum corneum is probably only two sheets of paper thick, so it hasn't got very far to go. Um, that said, there are certain active ingredients that have effects on the skin further down, and they do this by signaling within the skin. Peptides is a perfect case in point. A peptide is part of an amino acid which is part of a protein and the clever peptides mimic dead skin cells. Now your skin is so clever that it's constantly sending messages back and forth between the top layers and the lower layers. All these things happen all the time in your skin. Your skin's incredibly intelligent even though it doesn't have a brain but it does have constant messages being sent back and forth and clever skincare can either be adaptogen in other words, it tries to mimic those messengers or it produces things like peptides, vitamin C, vitamin A, that actually send signals down within the skin. So it doesn't have to get into the skin, it can lie on the surface of the skin, it can get into the epidermis, and then signals are interrupted or boosted, or in the case of anti-pigmentation problems, um, products, they are turned off or they're disrupted. So that's what skincare is trying to do when it's at its most intelligent. It's trying to, in some way, influence those pathways, those messengers that are coming back and forth between skin cells and different skin layers. Do you need to double cleanse? Ooh. I don't double cleanse. Um, and I always do what I call the towel test. So it's my job to test cleansers. I don't use one cleanser, then another cleanser. I don't even use a separate eye makeup remover. I use a single multi-phase cleanser and I take all my makeup off with one single cleanser and a microfiber cloth. And my test on whether a cleanser is working or not is I always have white towels. When my skin is damp after rinsing, I then give my skin a pat dry and maybe even a light gentle rub dry and I want zero deposit or makeup left on my face transferring to that towel. That said, I do use microfiber cloths. Everybody should be cleansing with some sort of cloth. I was shocked the other day when I worked with a makeup artist that said, I'm getting really bad congestion. And I said, what cleanser are you using? Really can't remember what cleanser he was using. And I said, do you use a cloth? Like he went, what do you mean? I said, like a flannel or a muslin cloth or a microfiber cloth. And he said, no. I said, how the hell do you get your makeup off? I mean, like a bit of micellar water with some cotton wool buds and then a cleanser. You need the physical action of removing makeup with a cloth. It's essential, absolutely essential. I think it's far more essential than double cleansing. I think double cleansing comes from a history of um, a skincare therapists, facialists who were taught to double cleanse. There's a myth that you need a double cleanse to remove your SPF. You really don't. <laughs> How can you need a double cleanse to remove your SPF at the end of the day and yet you're told to reapply your SPF every four hours because it keeps coming off your skin? Both of them cannot be true. You simply need a very effective, non-foaming, hydrating cleanser that is slightly emollient and a really good cloth, trust me. Um, feel free to double cleanse if you love to double cleanse. Some people simply like the ritual of double cleansing and that's what you get in a facial. I do not think it is essential. I very rarely get any congestion or breakouts at all. And I don't think I've ever double cleansed once in my entire life. Oh, Caroline, don't hate me. Caroline Hurrens and I are mates, it's fine. I'm sure she'd get hold of me and give me a damn good scrub if she could. Uh, and then uh, 
Finally, let's talk about if oils are good or bad for your skin. So we've talked about silicones, let's talk about oils. Uh, there are two schools of thought here. Again, there is either a beauty therapy idea where oils are used and aromatherapy oils and plant oils are used to massage the skin, to hydrate the skin, to do all those things. And then there's the dermatological school of thought where oils are not good for your skin. Most dermatologists are vehemently anti-oil. Now, here's the thing about oils is if a product is oil free, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have some sort of level of uh, biological breakdown synthesis from oil. So for example, it will have fatty acids in it. It will have um, a whole host of things that are found naturally in the skin that make up your natural moisturizing factors that can be derived from oils, but they're not pure oils. And the reason is very simple. When you put an oil on your skin, uh, and there are some that are excellent, I mean, if you look at something like rosehip oil that delivers a low dose of, of vitamin A, I won't say retinol because it's not a retinol. Uh, or you look at things like squalene, for example, which are really great for dry skin. Uh, all those products, when they're put on the skin, the skin cannot utilize them as they are. They sit on the surface of the skin where they stop transepidermal water loss. So they basically occlude the surface of the skin. Then the skin produces enzymes that breaks down those oils and it breaks them down into what it needs, i.e. things like glycerols, fatty acids, things like that. The dermatological school of thought would be, well, why not just do that in a lab, don't make the skin work over time and give it the active it needs, gives it the fatty acids, gives it the glycerols, all that sort of stuff. The more natural and beauty therapy school and essential oil school will say, just give it the plant oil. I'm firmly in the dermatological era here. Why make skin work any harder than it has to? Just give it what is natural to its skin. It's why essentially I don't mind byproducts of plant oils but I wouldn't really put that many plant oils on my face and I wouldn't really use a natural oil on my face. I certainly wouldn't use essential oils on my face. Uh, you know, I've been over the years spoken to by a lot of skincare scientists. I've been spoken to and lectured at by uh, aromatherapists, by beauty um, therapists, by facialists, by dermatologists, by laser surgeons, by nurses. And I go this side of being anti-oil. I am not anti-oil in the sense that I do use byproducts of oils. I just don't use pure oils on my face. I just don't see the point in making your skin work over time and metabolize the oils to get the active ingredients it needs when you can give the active ingredients directly to your skin. What does your skin need? It needs what's natural to your skin. If we could punch biopsy a 22 year old flawless faced person, I want what she's having. I don't want what is squeezed out of something from the Himalayas, up a mountain that a plant uses. They don't necessarily work together as far as I can see. I get that we want botanical derivatives that mimic what the skin does, but we don't actually want the pure botanical extract, in my opinion. I know there are a lot of people out there that will disagree with me. So they are my current most asked skincare questions that are on my YouTube group, which you can follow here, by the way. It's Nadine Baggett Community. I dip in and out. Oh my God, everybody is so supportive and they post reviews and they ask honest questions. Every so often I'll be highlighted in something and I'll go in and answer some questions. There's also a Nadine Baggett group on Facebook, which is just where I post all my content. And then obviously, on YouTube and on Instagram. And I try to answer everybody's questions. It's hard to keep up because I do get hundreds a day, but I promise you, I do go in every so often. Although I do like people not to slide into DMs. I like people to ask questions publicly because then people can go back in and see the answer and learn. So if you slide into my DMs, which I completely understand if it's a private question, you can't really share the knowledge and we're all about sharing the knowledge here. They are my current one, two, three, four, five, Biggest skincare questions and myths answered. Do you agree or disagree? Feel free to disagree. I like an honest, open debate. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing and I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.